This is the AAAS Brain Briefing on the Aging Brain. I'm Erin Heath, Associate Director of Government Relations at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. AAAS is the world's largest general scientific society, and we're dedicated to, to the advancement of scientific knowledge for the good of society as a whole. Now, this is the seventh year of this series, which is funded by the Dana Foundation. The Dana Foundation is a philanthropic organization that supports brain re research through grants and educates the public about the successes and potential of brain research. We thank them for their support. Also, a big shout out to my colleagues, Chloe McPherson and Nicole Rutledge, who helped plan this event. And finally, thanks go to the members and staff of the Congressional Neuroscience Cau Caucus. Thank you for your support. We have two fantastic speakers today. I'm going to give you the one sentence introduction and I encourage you to check out their full bios and your programs. I'll turn it over first to Dr. Wendy Suzuki. She's a professor of neuroscience and psychology in the Center for Neuroscience at New York University. Dr. Suzuki, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Erin. It is such a pleasure to be here, to be able to talk about um, issues about the aging brain. And my, my talk will really focus on how do you address um, some of the changes that happen with aging, in particular, how do you improve the brain? And uh, the topic of my, my talk today is really the idea of brain plasticity. How does the brain change in a positive way in response to the environment? Okay, and um, I always like to start with um, the idea of why it should be, why it should be um, on the top of our lists to understand the brain. I remember the very first day I decided I wanted to become a neuroscientist. I was a freshman at UC Berkeley and I took a um, freshman seminar class called The Brain and Its Potential at UC Berkeley from an amazing professor, Marion Diamond. And yeah. Oh, we have a Marion Diamond fan, yes. <laughs> and um, she is actually a, a, an extraordinary uh, um, uh, professor and researcher. And I didn't know that at the time, I just walked in. And I remember her standing at the front of the room, very, very striking um, presence there, kind of owning the classroom. And she said, every, I'm so happy that every single one of you are here because that shows that you want to understand your brain. And you want to understand your brain because understanding your brain means understanding yourself. Because the brain really defines how we see and feel and touch and experience the world. And as she was standing there, she actually had a hat box beside her. And she put her gloves on and she opened up the hat box. And out of it, she pulled a real preserved human brain, just like this one. So I wanted to introduce it because this is our topic for today. We all have one. How do we make this last for as long as possible? Let me give you a quick tour. So this is the front of the brain, the frontal lobe. If it was sitting in my head, it would be just like this. My eyes would be here and here. Frontal lobe, critical for our ability to, um, um, to think creatively. Um, decision making, um, attention, really critical uh, uh, function of the frontal lobe. Also for this talk, one of the key areas that tends to degenerate in aging, how can we address that, okay? Um, other brain areas at the very back of the brain here, this is right behind at the back of your head, occipital lobe, critical for vision. Without this part of the brain, you could have eyes that work just fine, but you cannot see anything. Sorry, I don't need to see that. Um, and <clears throat> third lobe down here, temporal lobe, critical for higher level vision. And if I flip this around, my very favorite brain area that I've studied for the last 25 years is situated just deep to this region right here and this region right here. You have two of them, one in uh, one temporal lobe and one in the other. It's a critical area for long-term memory. This area is called the hippocampus, okay? And so we'll talk a lot about that. How our long-term memory, one of the 
earliest uh, um, signs of, of perhaps the aging brain, uh, uh, lack of memory function. And the last lobe is this lobe right here, which is between the frontal lobe and the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe. So you can imagine a bunch of freshmen sit sitting in my class at, at, uh, at UC Berkeley just awestruck by the brain. Um, but in fact, that wasn't the reason why I decided to become a neuroscientist that day. It was the other science that Marion Diamond talked about. Let me just introduce her for a second. Here's a picture of Marion Diamond. Can you tell which one she is? Yeah. Okay. So Marion, uh, this is uh, in, the, in the early 1960s at the time point where she and her colleagues made a fundamental discovery right there at UC Berkeley. This was before I got there. And they asked a simple question, how can the brain or does the brain change in response to the environment? Is there any change in the adult brain. Now, why was this a question? This was a question because way back then, in the early 1960s, the dogma, the ideas in the field, was that once you got to adulthood, no change in your brain. Your cells could die, but no, no clear changes because there was no evidence that anything in the brain could change. Well, they sought out neuroscientific evidence that there was changes, and they did a simple but elegant experiment. What Mary and her colleagues did is she compared the brains of a group of rats raised in what they called an enriched environment. You can think of it like the Disney world of rat cages, okay? Big rat cages with, with lots of toys. This is actually a picture from one of the original, one of the, uh, original papers. And they, they let the rats live there for, for multiple months, and they compared the brains of these rats with rats uh, that lived in what they called impoverished environments. It's much smaller environments, no toys, of course, food and water, but no additional enrichment. And what they found really changed the way we think about neuroscience. Yes. Oh, sorry. What she found was um, really changed the way uh, uh, that we think about the brain and its ability to change. What she found is in these rats with, uh, that, that uh, were raised in the enriched environment, the outer covering of the brain, the cortex, this outer covering that you saw was so um, uh, corrugated here, it actually got thicker. Anatomical proof that the physical aspect of the brain changed in response to this enriched environment. But that's not all that changed. Looking more microscopically, they found more connections between individual brain cells or neurons. They found more, um, many more blood vessels. So the birth of new blood vessels is called angiogenesis. So do you think more blood vessels would be good or bad for the brain? Good, good. Why? Because the brain is our number one user of oxygen. And the way oxygen gets to the brain is through uh, blood vessels. So uh, being raised in this enriched environment enhances, uh, it gives you even more blood vessels. Also, growth factors inc increased. All of these changes, uh, the first demonstration of adult change in response to the environment. And those are the studies that made me walk out of that classroom that day and say, I want to become a neuroscientist. So I did. I studied my favorite form of neuroplasticity, which, is, uh, which was memory. And so, oh, before I did that, I just want to uh, uh, say, if you're interested in Marion Diamond, who was an amazing instructor as well as a revolutionary kind of uh, uh, scientist, there was a wonderful documentary that was just shown on PBS uh, it between February and, and May. Uh, you can get it online at PBS. It's just a really inspiring story of a neuroscience uh, neuroscientist and uh, the early days of studying um, kind of the brain and its potential and how it can change. It's called um, My Love Affair with the Brain, The Life and Science of Dr. Marion Diamond. So I highly recommend that. So inspired by Marion Diamond, I went off to study my own form of plasticity, which is, which was long-term memory. I, as I mentioned, a key structure critical for our ability to form new long-term memories is called the hippocampus, illustrated right here. You can see um, uh, the, the teal structure. It's deep within the temporal lobe. You can't see it from the outside. Hippocampus means seahorse. There's a really good reason why it's named hippocampus. On the left is a dissected human hippocampus, and on the right is a seahorse, so it really does look like a seahorse when you uh, dissect it out. So um, 
Uh, for many years, I studied uh, the hippocampus, and, and uh, relative to our topic today, again, this is a structure that can change. There is synaptic loss in the hippocampus with aging that could cause a more early um, uh, a memory loss and is one of the earliest signs of uh, uh, more severe forms of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. But what I want to turn to is kind of the main topic of my talk, that is, how can we improve the function of the hippocampus. And that was a topic not inspired by some professor, amazing professor I had, but by my own personal experience. So um, like many of you in this room, uh, I have a very all-consuming job. I know there's a lot of congressional people and, and uh, um, people that, that live and work in, in Washington, and um, scientists like that all consuming. And I remember 1998 when I got my first lab uh, at New York University, the lab that I still run today. Um, it was so exciting, but all consuming. And I remember thinking that, that um, the feeling in the lab in those first seven years as I was, I, was, I was working to get tenure, it looked something like this. Great dinner party. Just always somebody interesting to talk to and always something interesting to talk about. But as probably many of you know, uh, with great intense work comes um, um, uh, an ignoring of other things. It, uh, with, with it comes uh, lots of nights eating takeout, um, standing up uh, over your sink. Uh, and so uh, while the lab atmosphere was like this, if I think back on those first seven years at New York University and think about my social life, it looked more like this. Uh, and, and also, all that, all that takeout, I, I literally, I gained 25 pounds. So um, like many people, I went to the gym. Um, I didn't know how exactly how to fix the social life, but I, I did go to the gym because I, 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 um, I uh, had gained 25 pounds. So um, there's one thing that kept me going to the gym. Many people start and fail, and it was a class that I discovered at the gym. It was called Intensati. Has anybody heard of, of the workout called Intensati? So it was developed in New York City by uh, an amazing fitness instructor named Patricia Moreno, and it pairs physical movements with positive spoken affirmations. So in kickboxing class, you might be punching back and forth, but in intensati class, you have to say something while you're punching. You say something like, I am strong now. And I remember the first time I went to class, I felt like a complete idiot um, doing this. But there's a method to the madness. Um, but first of all, uh, shouting things out while you're exercising, it increases the cardio load. And it turns out that by actually declaring these positive things, you really boost the kind of positive mood boosting elements of exercise. How many people have noticed that when they exercise, even walking can improve their mood? Has anybody noticed that? OK, so I went to this class. I noticed this huge mood boost immediately. Kept me going, kept me going. And that was great. But I noticed something really critical. About a year and a half in to regular aerobic exercise. And I noticed this one day when I was sitting in my, at my desk uh, at New York University writing a grant. This is what we have to do a lot, those of you from NIH. And I had a thought that went through my mind that morning, I still remember that morning, um, that had never gone through my mind before. And that thought was, gee, grant writing is going well today. I'd never had that thought before. And um, uh, it really made me sit up and, look, and take notice. And I realized that I felt like the grant writing was going better because I, I could focus my attention deeper and longer than I had before. And my memory, the topic that, I'd been, that I was studying in my lab using animal models, my memory was better. I was able to remember all the details from all of the hundreds of papers that I was trying to synthesize into my award-winning grant arguments. And so, of course, being a neuroscientist, I went back to the literature to find out what we knew about the effects of physical aerobic exercise in people. And here's what I found. Number one, mood boosts. Even a single bout of aerobic exercise increases levels of key neurotransmitters associated with mood in the brain. Those neurotransmitters include serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline. That's also important for memory. So that 
okay, fine, that's, that's at least part of the explanation, that seems to be part of the explanation for the increased mood boost. Then I surveyed the clinical studies on the effects of exercise, most of which have been done in the aging population. What I found was the most common finding is increased aerobic exercise and this was a wide variety from just walking more around the block to more intensive uh, workouts. The most common finding is that people that increase aerobic activity improve their ability to shift and focus their attention. That is, the, the functions dependent on the frontal lobe. And third, I went back to the literature. And when I, as I was exploring this, I went back a little bit more in history. And I found a name that was very familiar. That name was Marion Diamond. Because it turned out that um, after I left UC Berkeley, others had gone, gone through and asked, well, what is it about that enriched environment, that Disney world of rat cages, that were causing all of those brain changes, the morphological thickening of the cortex, more synapses, more um, blood vessels? And they found that the single element that was causing most of those brain changes within the enriched environment was giving the rats more exercise. When there was lots of toys and lots of other rats around, they were running around much more. They were literally getting more exercise. And one of the major findings is that increased aerobic exercise has a very specific effect on that key structure important for long-term memory, the hippocampus. What is that effect? Well, every one of us, whether you're a lab, uh, lab rat, a, uh, a gym rat, <laughs> some, of her, some of us are both gym rats and lab rats, um, whether you're a, 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 a gym rat or, or not, everybody um, has a little bit of, a uh, little bit, a few new uh, hippocampal brain cells being born in your adulthood. Um, and this is a continuous process. This is called hippocampal neurogenesis. And um, it turns out that increased physical aerobic exercise, and this has been studied extensively in rodent models, actually stimulates the birth of even more hippocampal brain cells. Okay? So when I, when I realized this, I had been, you know, it wasn't on my, my radar. I said, that is my motivation. I already was motivated to go to the gym but I want as many shiny new hippocampal cells in my brain as possible. I want so many that my hippocampus gets bigger because I know this is a structure that can deteriorate. The, the synapses can die, the cells can die in many uh, instances in aging. So um, at this point, I was still focused on the physiology of studying the hippocampus. But I was interested in learning more about the topic of uh, aerobic ac activity. And as a professor at an undergraduate university, I know that the best way to do that is to teach a new undergraduate course on the topic. So I decided to teach a new course called Can Exercise Change Your Brain, where I was going to uh, um, give the students that, that, that little summer I gave you in the last five minutes over the whole semester. But I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I could actually bring exercise into the classroom and <laughs> allow them to feel the effects of exercise, and then I'll tell them about the effects of, of what exercise is doing to their brain. So I went to the administration, I said, I have a great idea. All you have to do is give me some extra money to hire an exercise instructor, and we'll, we'll exercise for the semester, and I will, I will give, give the class. And they said, well, we pay you to teach the, class, the students. No extra money for an extra exercise instructor. So I went back to my desk, and I said, OK, well, if they're not going to pay for an exercise instructor, then maybe I'll just go to the gym and become certified as an exercise instructor myself, which I did, which started the longest preparation for an undergraduate <laughs> class that I've ever <laughs> undertaken. Because I had a teacher training that lasted a week and six months of practice. And of course, the class that I wanted to teach was this intensity class that paired physical movements with positive spoken affirmations, because I, I knew it was very, very um, uh, inspiring and, and fun, and I thought it would be a great, great pairing. So during this time, I'm, of course, preparing the undergraduate class. I'm reading all the clinical studies and all the rodent models, and it's a great topic for, for a class. But then I thought, this, I'm going to have undergraduate students exercising more for a whole semester. 
maybe they could be my first subjects in an exercise study. So I collaborated with colleagues at, at Columbia University who provided um, a memory task that could be sensitive, we didn't know, might be sensitive to the effects of exercise. And the, the kind of the task was, or the class was, was uh, complete. All the students would be tested cognitively at the beginning and at the end of the semester, and each session during the semester would be an hour of exercise that I would teach, followed by an hour and a half lecture discussion about what exercise was doing to their brain. So September 7th, 2009 was the first day of the fall semester, and I arrived in the classroom that I'd been teaching in for the last 15 years. But three things were different. The first thing that was different was that I was clad head to toe in spandex because I, I had to teach an exercise class. Second thing that was different is I was really nervous. And I, I don't get nervous giving lectures. I'm very comfortable doing that. But I'd never taught the exercise part. And I was very nervous. The third thing that was different was the students. So you know, students on the first day of fall semester, they're, they're excited, you know, maybe a little bit nervous. These students look terrified. They, they, I think once they saw me in my spandex, they, they didn't know whether, whether they really wanted to be there. But I have to say that that class uh, really transformed uh, the way that um, I taught. And I, I wanted to just, um, because I've already told you that exercise improves your mood, focuses your attention, and improves your memory. And I wanted to to make sure that you all remember everything that I say. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up, because we're going to do three minutes of exercise. OK. So you don't need spandex for three minutes. OK? You need it for an hour, but not for three minutes. OK. So all you have to do is do what I do and say what I say. We're good. Before I turn the music on, we do a little test. OK? So. All you have to do is punches right and left. Go right, left, right, left. And I say, I am strong now. You say it. I am strong now. OK, perfect. Now, music. OK, ready? OK, here we go. Four, three, two, punches. Go right, left, right, left. I am really strong. You say it. I am really strong. Girls, I am Wonder Woman strong. You say it. I am Wonder Woman strong. Guys, I am Superman strong. You. Good. New move. Uppercut. Right and left. Right, left, right, left. I am. Inspired now, you say it. I am inspired now. Again, I am inspired right now. You say it. I am inspired right now. Okay, Okay, good, yeah. I want you all to think back to your college career 
and think about what it would have been like to do that for an hour before every one of your classes. Okay? So that's what we did. And um, first of all, it kind of, trans it kind of, it transformed the classroom um, into one that was one person standing in the front of the room and, and lecturing, uh, to one that was much more interactive. And that was evident the very first day. Uh, it, it, it changed the way that I taught every other class because I knew uh, now, I know now, the level interaction that is possible in a classroom. And that's what I try and get every time. But the second way it changed, um, changed my life, really, is that um, we got some really interesting findings from this. this uh, it, was, it was, you know, not a real uh, study. It wasn't randomized controlled. But what did, our, did my students improve their memory? And what we found was, now remember, this was only once a week for a 15-week semester. We had a wide range of different students um, in, I did it twice in those two classes, ranging from students that didn't do any other aerobic exercise except that class to the starting point guard of the NYU men's varsity basketball team who was in the first uh, 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 class and who ended up working in my lab. What did we see? We saw significant effects on reaction time. Students in my class, compared to, I forgot to tell you, I had a control class, another elective class uh, that I went around and I asked my colleagues, hey, are you actually making your students exercise during class? And they said no. And I said, can I use them as a control? And they said yes. <laughs> so I tested them at the beginning and the end of the semester. And compared to them, um, my students had faster reaction time. That is, they answered the correct memory questions quicker than the other students. And there was an interesting trend in general mood where the students in the other class that was not, that was not exercising had a precipitous decrease in mood over the semester, which is the point that I realized I was doing a stress study, not necessarily a memory study, because uh, the level of stress is very, very different from the beginning to the end of the semester. I had no choice but to test them at the end right before their finals. And, um, but my, my students did not show that same decrease in mood. And again, one of the, one of the pieces of, strong pieces of evidence is that regular exercise can enhance your mood. So this was not a groundbreaking study. It was a very small study, but it was one that completely inspired me to ask, well, maybe I could study the effects of exercise. Maybe if I, could, if I could just get these students to exercise, not just once a week, but maybe three times a week, what would I see? And so over the last five or six years, I've actually shifted my entire research focus from studying the neurophysiology of cells in the hippocampus as animals are learning new, uh, uh, forming new associations, learning new things, to studying the effects of physical aerobic exercise on um, um, mood, memory, and attention. And we have two major questions we want to address. One is, um, what is the exercise prescription? How much, how long, what kind? After these talks, everybody comes up to me and say, well, Wendy, you talk so much, just tell me how much I should exercise, right? Um, in fact, they say, just, just tell me the least amount of exercise that I have to do <laughs> to really get these brain changes that you're talking about. And the fact is that we can say, uh, give a general guideline that yes, aerobic exercise seems to be good. Um, it can be good for, uh, um, certainly good in older populations. There's less information about healthy uh, adults uh, like I see uh, uh, around this room. There's also, I should say, uh, really strong correlational evidence showing that the longer and more consistently you are, you, are, you are physically active over your lifetime. I'm not talking about triathletes. I'm talking about people that walk regularly. The, um, le less, uh, um, 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 the less likely you are to develop dementia. Okay? So there's, there's lots of exciting, intriguing correlations, but no prescription. And so that's Question number one. Question number two, what is the mechanism? How is it exactly that moving your limbs around and moving your body physically is actually affecting your brain? What are those neurochemical pathways? And um, I want to give you one key word, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, has anybody heard of this, this factor? 
Yes, so it is certainly not the only one involved. There are so many things going on in physical aerobic exercise. I highlight this one because this is the factor that we know the most about. And let me give you just one little tidbit of the exciting new findings that are being um, discovered today. And that is there are now three pathways that show that physical aerobic exercise releases factors or hormones in the body. One, factors that are myokines released from the muscles that are w working. Um, one factor is a um, ketone body that's released from the liver during exercise. And another one is yet another hormone associated with a different hormone associated with muscle uh, activity. These factors uh, um, during exercise are released into the bloodstream. They've been shown to pass the blood brain barrier. And what do they do? They go and stimulate the release of this brain derived neurotrophic factor in our favorite structure, or my favorite structure in the brain, the hippocampus. Why is that important? Brain derived, uh, um, brain derived neurotrophic factor is critical for allowing new hippocampal neurogenesis to take place. So you want as much brain derived neurotrophic factor as you can around to stimulate all of those new uh, um, neurons that are being born to, um, um, to grow up and, and um, connect and, and start to uh, be active in the brain. It's, uh, there's also evidence that this may be uh, helpful for the functioning of the prefrontal cortex. Remember I told you that the most common finding with increased aerobic exercise is improved prefrontal function. So I just want to end with the implications that I think are so important, not just for all of us in the room today, but as we age. The first implication is for education. So I'm a professor at New York University, and um, um, one of the things I want to do is make New York University the exercise university. Um, this is NYU graduation. The only venue in New York that's big enough for graduation of all NYU students is Yankee Stadium. So this is a picture of Yankee Stadium. And so we've just completed a pilot study looking at the effects of one semester of increased aerobic exercise relative to one semester of no change of aerobic exercise and see significant improvements in grades, in working memory function, dependent on the prefrontal cortex, in recognition memory, and in mood. All of these things that have been shown primarily in older people can be seen in the healthy, young, um, high-functioning NYU students. And um, I want to try and, and really hone down, again, that exercise prescription. Can we kind of uh, enhance the value of education uh, through the use of, of exercise? Healthy adults. So um, imagine what would happen if all of the healthy working adults in, uh, in the country improved their, their exercise, increased their aerobic exercise, resulting in better mood, better attention, and better long-term memory. What would that do to productivity? What would that do to levels of um, um, uh, heart, uh, um, heart and cancer levels that are also associated with uh, um, decreases when, increase, uh, with, uh, when exercise goes up. And finally, the topic of this talk, which is aging. So um, don't get me wrong, uh, uh, increased aerobic exercise is never going to cure neurodegenerative diseases. <clears throat> but two of the key brain areas um, that are targets in aging are the two that we've been talking about today. That is the prefrontal cortex, that allows you to focus and shift your attention, and the hippocampus that allows you to improve your long-term memory. So what are you doing as you exercise, especially what are you doing as you exercise over your lifespan? You are increasing the levels of brain-derived neurogrowth factor, as well as, I'm sure, many other growth factors. You're changing the metabolism in your brain that result in strengthening of both the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. This is not going to cure you if you do have the neurodegenerative disease of Alzheimer's. But what it will do is it will allow you to have normal cognitive function for longer than you would have if you hadn't exercised for, for those years. So all of this data is um, absolutely critical for our um, current brain health and our future brain health. So I'm going to leave you with three simple take-home messages. One. I've shown you evidence, or I've described for you evidence, that physical aerobic exercise causes a range of positive changes throughout the brain that include the frontal lobe and the
the hippocampus. <clears throat> I've told you that the more consistently you include physical activity in your life, the larger the overall positive brain effects you will accumulate over your lifetime. And finally, you don't need to be a triathlete to get these benefits. And in fact, it's going to be an interesting prescription because we know that walking alone, both walking and kind of aerobic exercise, both improve mood. So to get the mood effects, all you have to do is walk. In fact, in one study in my lab, we compared the effects of, um, um, of sitting, walking, continuous aerobic exercise, and high intensity interval training on mood. Which one do you think caused significantly largest, the significantly largest mood improvement? Walking. walking. Okay, now, now continuous aerobic exercise and high intensity interval training got you boosted relative to just sitting, but the one that was best at improving your mood was simply walking. Now walking's probably not going to get you more hippocampal brain cells. I think you need, uh, that, well the evidence suggests <clears throat> that you need more um, aerobic activity for that, but you can start with walking. So, um, that is where I'll end, and um, uh, my goal is always that everybody feels like going to the gym tomorrow. So I hope you all feel like going to the gym for tomorrow, and I thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Marie Bernard. Dr. Bernard is the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging, part of the National Institutes of Health. We're pleased to have you here. So Dr. Suzuki, you definitely inspired me. I did not make it to the gym this morning, but I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> um, I'm going to give a much more 50,000 foot view of the science, and in particular, I've been asked to talk about Alzheimer's disease in the aging brain. Um, you see my disclaimer there, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm a geriatrician, um, but as in the commercial that talks about the person who spent the night in the hotel and now they're an expert, I've been at in the National Institute on Aging for almost a decade now, and I've been very immersed in what's going on with the neuroscience and Alzheimer's research, so I'm going to give you an overview of that. Uh, what I intend to do is to talk about who's most susceptible to Alzheimer's disease, uh, where we are in making the diagnosis, what treatments may be promising, and uh, what things might be effective for prevention. Before I do that, however, I want to know, how many of you know someone who has an Alzheimer's type dementia? And how many of you fear that you may end up caring for someone with an Alzheimer's type dementia if you're not already? And how many of you think you might end up getting Alzheimer's type dementia? Okay. Um, it is something that's a very prevalent illness, uh, and the point I'd like to make for you is that it's a disease of aging. Back in 1950, uh, when we baby boomers were generally born, uh, the segment of the population that was 65 and over was maybe 4 to 5 percent. Uh, what we're seeing is that um, for the first time in history, there's now a convergence not only in the United States, but worldwide in the percentage of individuals who are 65 and older with those who are five and under. Um, this is because of lots of things that have happened. Better sanitation, antibiotics, vaccinations, better care of chronic illnesses. So the 65 and older population is growing in number, uh, and there are a bunch of us because we are baby boomers who were born in the 50s, uh, and people are having fewer children, so there's a convergence. And it's anticipated that by 2050, there will be a convergence uh, or divergence with many more people 65 and older than those who are five and under. And Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's type dementia is a disease of aging. As is shown here, if you look at people who are 65 to 74, only less than 5% have evidence or risk for Alzheimer's disease. When you start looking at people who are 75 to 84, that gets to be a little more than 15%. And when you see people who are 85 and older, the risk of Alzheimer's type dementia is about one in three. Um, so um, if you make it that far, you are at risk. Uh, if you have friends or family members who make it that far, they are also at risk. 
uh, it's a costly illness uh, worldwide. Uh, next year, it's projected that it's going to be uh, some $1 trillion in cost. That's expected to double by 2030. When you look very specifically what's happening in the United States, um, um, it's uh, illness that is very costly. Heard and colleagues looking at results from our health and retirement study, which is a national probability sample of people 50 years of age and older followed through to death, uh, estimated that in 2010, the direct cost for Alzheimer's disease, hospitalizations, medications, et cetera, was about $110 billion. Uh, they found that when you take into consideration the additional cost, um, lost wages for family and friends who are caring for that individual, or the cost of providing professional care for that individual, the cost for Alzheimer's disease care was about $210 billion. And it's projected that by 2040, not even taking into consideration inflation, just looking at the aging of the population, those costs will be something like $275 billion in direct costs, and um, when you take into consideration the total cost, 375 to 510 billion dollars. So it's uh, something that all of us are at risk for. It becomes particularly costly in those last five years of life. Um, this is a study by Amy Kelly and colleagues who looked at the total cost for dementia care versus uh, uh, cardiovascular disease or lung cancer. Uh, this is following people through to death. And they found that whether you looked at Medicare and Medicaid costs, out-of-pocket expenditures, or implicit costs, again, caregivers of these individuals, it was much more expensive to care for a person with dementia, uh, and it's generally Alzheimer's type dementia, than people with something like a cardiovascular disease or cancer that's causing their death. So it's a very prevalent illness. Uh, it's likely to touch lots of us, whether directly or indirectly. Um, and so it's important to be able to make the diagnosis. And I can say that 10 years ago, um, we would say that you can only really make this diagnosis uh, at autopsy. Uh, it was, it's a diagnosis of exclusion clinically. You look at the signs and symptoms, it's probably, but you need to, you know, you need to have the brain like Dr. Suzuki provided. Um, we now have had some significant advances that allow us to look into the brain years in advance. And if you watch, there's a timeline at the bottom. It's, uh, years before the actual onset of Alzheimer's disease, and this is an aggregate of what's been found by our researchers looking at people with uh, a genetically determined type of Alzheimer's disease. But over the course of time, you see accumulation of changes in the brain. This is a representative of Alzheimer's plaques uh, that are accumulating in the brain years before the person uh, develop symptoms that allow you to make the diagnosis, and it's a progressive sort of thing over the course of time. Um, we have gotten really skilled in the research lab at looking at things, and all of these spaghetti lines represent various things that we can look at. We can look at cerebral spinal fluid uh, levels of amyloid beta. We can look at hippocampal volume. We can look at deposition of amyloid beta and, and tau and imaging. We can look at cerebral spinal fluid tau. Um, after symptoms, they're all these things that are abnormal. Uh, but the thing that's really neat is that with uh, before symptoms, as much as a decade before symptoms, you can find these same changes, and that can help you to uh, think that a person is on their way to developing an Alzheimer's-type dementia. It is still challenging, however, because you can have people with normal scans, uh, you can have people with abnormal scans, and then you can have people in between who have abnormal scans and yet normal cognition, and you need to follow them over the course of time in the research laboratory to get a sense of whether this is really going one way or another. We have lots of examples of autopsies of people who have lots of changes within the brain that are consistent with Alzheimer's disease, but were cognitively normal prior to death. So you don't know if you catch a person at one point in time whether they are a resilient individual who will not have problems, or whether they're going to go on to have truly full-blown Alzheimer's disease. Um, so the research goes on so that we can get better at predicting uh, and hopefully get this translated into something that can be used clinically. Nonetheless, we're looking at opportunities to treat and make a difference in the course of this illness. Uh, one approach is looking at a cohort of individuals in the country of Colombia. This is something that's been highlighted on 60 Minutes now three times, the most recent time is in the last month. 
These are individuals who have a presenilin-1 mutation. It's an autosomal dominant change that um, if you have the gene, you're very likely to develop Alzheimer's uh, type dementia within your 40s. Um, so, and it's a very large group of individuals in Columbia who have this, uh, thousands of individuals. So these very brave souls are partic participating in this trial that we help to support. Um, at baseline, they have normal scans as is shown here. Those who do not have the gene end up having scans that look like this. Uh, but those who do have the gene have changes in the brain already in their 30s before they have symptoms. And what's being done in the trial is a drug is being given to try to remove amyloid from the brain with the hopes that this will slow or forestall the development of the illness. Um, it's an ongoing trial. We'll see, uh, hopefully in a few years, the outcomes. Another trial, kind of on the same basis, trying to look at removing uh, amyloid from the brain is uh, led by Risa Sperling and colleagues at Brigham and Women's, looking at uh, moving, removing amyloid from the brains of individuals who have those scans that show that there's been a lot of accumulation there, but again, they're not yet symptomatic. They're not necessarily people with a presenilin one mutation, but they may be people who have something called an APO4, APOE4 or other risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. They're without symptoms at this point. And what's being done is we're looking at whether this intervention can reduce damage to the brain and delay cognitive decline. Still another approach uh, being done at Wake Forest Uni University is looking at intranasal insulin administration. Why would that work? Well, what's been found is that with uh, Alzheimer's disease, there are changes in, in the neurons so that they are not as responsive to glucose as is normal, and glucose is necessary for the function of the nerve. Uh, some people call it a type 3 diabetes. And uh, the, the hypothesis here is that if you deliver insulin close to the blood-brain barrier in that area by the nares you know, um, is very close to that blood-brain barrier, that you can reverse those changes. Uh, and it can be helpful to people who have uh, mild cognitive impairment or early Alzheimer's. So this is further along than the people in the Columbia study. Um, there was a pilot study done trying this, and it seemed to have some very good outcomes. So this is a larger trial to see whether there can be some definitive findings that would be helpful to these individuals. Um, and you may have seen in time, a little more than a year ago, uh, discussion of this uh, drug with a very catchy title, LM11A31, uh, <laughs> which is a modulator of a uh, neurotrophin receptor. Uh, we're very pleased to say that we've been able to help support the development of this. Uh, we, through our translational research program, our toxicology program, and our support of the phase two clinical trial, helped it to move along. It's now even further along. We'll see whether, and we'll see what they actually name it. And we've had a very nice discussion of exercise by Dr. Suzuki. Uh, we have ongoing, uh, just really getting started, uh, a trial of exercise for people with, with early Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment um, to see whether you can make a difference for these individuals in their cognition, their functional status, uh, the brain atrophy and blood flow that she described, and those cerebral spinal fluid biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease that I mentioned. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have more than 30 ongoing clinical trials looking at uh, trying to intervene at lots of different places. Uh, but that gives you a feel for what's going on. So then the question always arises, can you do anything to prevent this? Um, because even though not many people said that they thought they were likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, if you make it to age 65, you're very likely to make it to 85. If you make it to 85, you're very likely to make it to 92. And that's the time period in which you are at risk for uh, showing evidence for this disease, one out of three. Um, so what can we do? Um, we um, supported a uh, study uh, done jointly by the Agency for Health Research and Quality and the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Math to try to step back and look at all of the studies that have been done to try to make a difference for Alzheimer's type dementia. Um, we had done something like that back in 2010, and at that time, um, it was considered, it was called a state of the science study done on the NIH campus, uh, and the panel at that time felt that there was not sufficient evidence to say that you can 
make a public health message that you need to do X, Y, and Z, that prescription Dr. Suzuki talked about to prevent Alzheimer's type dementia. We asked these groups to come together again last year because there was a lot of feeling in the scientific community that things have changed rapidly. Um, we ought to look at this again. Uh, and we asked ARCA National Academies to do this because the Agency for Health Research and Quality has very well-respected evidence-based approaches to evaluating the literature. Um, their methodology is used, uh, or the outcomes of their studies using that methodology is used by the United States Preventive Services Task Force for making recommendations for prevention. Uh, and the National Academies is very good at uh, bringing together experts in an unbiased fashion um, to look at information. So the Agency for Health Research and Quality did their usual very rigorous review of the literature. Um, and the question that was put to the two groups is, or was, uh, whether there are interventions that can prevent Alzheimer's type dementia, amnestic mild cognitive impairment, which is the type that's most likely to go on to Alzheimer's disease, and age-related cognitive decline that Dr. Uh, Suzuki was talking about. Uh, I emphasize interventions and prevention because there was a Lancet article that came out just yesterday uh, suggesting that uh, from their review of modification of risk factors for dementia that you could potentially decrease the likelihood of dementia by 30%. Um, they were not looking at interventions per se and we weren't looking at risk factors we're here. We were looking at very specifically things like exercise or diet or whatever. Um, they, in fact, uh, the ARC group looked at some 13 different categories. I have a cheat sheet here. Cognitive training, physical activity, nutraceuticals, diet, hormones, vitamins, antihypertensives, lipid-lowering drugs, non-steroidals, anti-dementia drugs, diabetes drugs, and other sorts of things. Um, and they provided their final report this past December, so it's available online at the National Academies, Academies if one is interested. Um, their key messages were that most interventions showed no evidence of benefit, unfortunately. Um, they did find that some forms of cognitive training uh, to improve the performance of a specific target for adults with normal cognition could be potentially beneficial. This is based primarily on a study that we supported more than a decade ago called the ACTA trial, Advanced Cognitive Training for Independent and Vital Elderly. Uh, and it consisted of having older adults uh, over the course of several weeks, several times per week, go through training for speed of processing of information or memory or for reasoning. Uh, and the study was very effective. Uh, however, um, there was no little evidence that there's crossover to other domains. Um, there's little evidence that it reduces dementia. Uh, and the benefit of that intervention could not be reliably demonstrated to be beyond two years, even though they've followed the subjects for as much as 10 years, there's drop off, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and they did find that some types of physical activity, when you read through it in particular, they, they talk about aerobic activity and vitamin B12 plus folic acid could potentially be beneficial for people uh, who have normal cognition. So then the National Academies pulled this together to look at it because we were afraid that this was what the literature was going to show. Uh, and we particularly wanted to know, well, what can we do? Because many of the, the interventions that may be needed to help prevent dementia, again, as Dr. Suzuki said, it may be something that needed to be started when someone was in college, or at least when they were middle-aged. Um, and it's a disease that's going to show itself when they're in their 80s. Uh, we don't typically support studies for that length of time. Um, so um, they brought together neuroscientists, geriatricians, public health experts, uh, communication experts, and very thoroughly reviewed the data and brought in some epidemiologic data to help inform their recommendations. Uh, and what they said is that there is insufficient evidence to justify a public health campaign that you can do X, Y, and Z to prevent dementia. Uh, but they felt that there was encouraging but inconclusive evidence about the cognitive training that I've mentioned to you about blood pressure management in people who have high blood pressure. Now, the cognitive training was to prevent age-related cognitive decline, blood pressure management actually to prevent dementia uh, uh, because 
we know pathologically there are often vascular changes in the brain uh, associated with the Alzheimer's type dementia. If a person's hypertensive and you manage that, perhaps that will help uh, decrease the risk. And again, increased physical activity. So again, you should be happy that Dr. Suzuki gave you a chance to do a little bit of exercise. I hope everyone's at the gym tomorrow. Um, the report is now available. It was released just last month. Um, and I have a few takeaway points for you as well. I'd like you to be cognizant, even those of you who look really young in here, that everyone is at risk, directly or indirectly. Um, if you live long enough, you currently, based upon the statistics, have a one out of three chance of developing Alzheimer's type dementia. You're very likely to have a friend or family member or neighbor who's gonna have an Alzheimer's type dementia, and it can be really demanding. Um, I'd like to say that there's been significant progress in establishing a research diagnosis for this illness. Uh, as I mentioned, previously you needed to have the autopsy. Now there's a lot in the laboratory that we can do that would suggest that a person may have Alzheimer's type dementia and hopefully eventually it can be translated to the clinic. Uh, we're looking at lots of different ways of treating people. Uh, whether one or more of these will prove to be effective, only time will tell. Um, and there's clearly further room for research with regards to prevention. Uh, in general, there's room for more research. And we at the National Institutes of Health are particularly grateful for the boost in uh, budget that have allowed us to really expand our research in these areas in the last couple of years. You'll note that I said nothing about caregiving. That would take another um, many minutes that I don't have, but I just wanted to make you aware that there is going to be a research summit on dementia care on the NIH campus in mid-October, um, and uh, I think the registration site will be opening for that next week or so. So I'll uh, share with you nia.nih.gov if you wanted to have any information. Uh, in particular, we have a brain health resource that's available at that site. We have an Alzheimer's disease education and referral center, um, and we have a blog that uh, keeps people up to date on the latest science that's going on in our institute. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. We are almost out of time, but I'm willing to take a couple of questions. Yes, Russ. Uh, I, I have a question about the, the onset stage. So, um, you, for example, this uh, Columbia study that you saw that you heard the other day, um, and, and, and the PET scanning now is a new technique to identify the amyloid plaques that, uh, that were not available in, uh, before. Um, and, and as you pointed out, there are uh, there's evidence of amyloid plaques even before onset. But onset is what? When, when somebody has. Uh, symptoms that are so severe, they're going to the doctor, and they say, wait, I have this thing, and then they do some kind of uh, cognition test or something like that. Most people have, I think like all people have, some certain amount of cognitive reserve, and so um, so, so it, is, it, is it possible that they actually have onset before you use up that cognitive reserve, and they may... You understand what I'm saying? I understand exactly what you're saying, and yes, it is conceivable. Currently, Still, the official means of making a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is that one has functional problems that interfere with their being able to continue with their normal life and cognitive changes in multiple spheres. And so that's going to manifest itself at different times in different people depending upon what they're doing. For instance, if you are an accountant or a scientist and you're not able to deal with numbers well any longer, that's going to impair your function much more rapidly than if you were a retired uh, person out fishing and, and not having to do those sorts of things. Uh, that's actually led to our scientific community looking at revising how one thinks about those things and um, thinking about the possibility that there's a pathologic diagnosis and then there's a clinical diagnosis. Um, how that will be useful in the real world is still unclear to me as a geriatrician because the reality of the matter is that uh, until people truly have functional problems and cognitive problems, um, they're not going to come to the doctor, they're not going to be concerned, but uh, we're trying to work that out. But are they doing studies where they do a, co a rigorous cognitive cognition study at, you know, like age, for example, in the Colombian population, mm -hmm. age 20, age 30, 30, they uh, have no uh, 
uh, sort of uh, societal uh, uh, symptoms, mm -hmm. but but the PET scan shows that they do, mm -hmm. and and to follow it in that regard, as, or or those cognition studies to be uh, too blunt. Uh, Thus far, the cognition studies have proven to be an uh, overly blunt instrument, and so it's hard to pick up on changes uh, many, many years in advance. Uh, but there is the opportunity to follow in those populations where you know that they're going to get the illness at a certain time, uh, how those changes might occur. The vast majority of individuals are not, um, you know, with a presenilin-1 mutation and, and a predictable time of onset. And therefore, you don't know when you're encountering someone for the first time, you know, how things may go. Um, so it, it's a challenge. But we have a lot of much smarter people than me working on it uh, and trying to refine those tools so that we will have something that might be useful as a signal above and beyond the cerebral spinal fluid and the imaging. I'll take two more questions. Yes. Sure. So um, and it's, it's a big topic. So exercise on a regular basis. The, the most established in terms of uh, timeline studies are uh, the early correlational studies that still hold up today, that the longer you have regular exercise in your life, and, and um, um, including walking, regular walking. Uh, there are some well-cited studies that uh, were done in Hawaii where you can walk 365 days a year. And um, uh, the longer and more regularly you walked, the uh, lesser chance you had of developing dementia. Now, those are, those are correlational studies. Of course, we all now want to move to interventional studies and, and doing the kinds of things that you were suggesting. Can we follow a group and do all the tests every few years and really see what's going on? Those aren't there. But I can tell you that the most, um, uh, the largest number of exercise, uh, randomly randomized control studies and exercise have been done in the older population. And it's clear that increases of exercise between three and, and six months uh, do significantly change the brain. Most of them have not, well, that's not true. Um, they, they improve uh, a, attention function, they can increase the size of the hippocampus, and they can even improve cognition uh, and memory in people with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. So those those are the kind of core findings from, from the literature. And I guess I would just re reinforce that when the Agency of Health Research and Quality did their review for us, um, I, they saw signals along those lines. Mm -hmm. The big challenge being that the best quality evidence would be randomized controlled trial with clearly specified outcomes at the out, uh, before you got started with the study, and there aren't many yeah, of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that's helpful to us to hear as we think about going forward with other research that we might support. We have time for one more. Yes. I'm not necessarily familiar with that specific trial, but I am very hopeful because 20 years ago, um, there wasn't as much knowledge as we have now. I didn't even talk about all the genetic discoveries. I mean, 10 years ago, there were only three or four genes that we knew were associated with Alzheimer's disease. Now, 24 or more. Uh, and as we untangle the pathways by which these work, there's going to be the opportunity for other targeting uh, for treatment 
for the illness. Uh, there are so many really smart people uh, working on this across the globe. In fact, the Alzheimer's Association International Conference just ended yesterday uh, with all sorts of new findings and discoveries being shared in that setting. Um, so I think there's so much activity going on and so much better understanding that if you try to intervene early as opposed to late when there's been a lot of damage done to the brain that you may have some changes, you may be able to see a signal there. I'm, ho I'm hopeful. You know, we'll see. You never can tell with science, but I'm hopeful. Well, I love ending on a note of hope. Let's thank our speakers. <laughs> Now, there will be more brain briefings this year, so stay tuned. Until then, thanks, everybody. I wanted to ask.